I was so amazingly flattered uh, when they asked me to do this. I came home and I told my husband, like, I'm history. <laughs> It was just, I was a feather in my cap, it's something to brag about, I can tell my godchild about this, and then I realized I would actually have to stand up here and do this, and I have been terrified ever since, my husband will back me up on that too, because I realized that I would actually have to stand up here and talk about myself the whole time. Now anybody who has seen my show and has seen Patsy the Klein knows that there's a a song in the show uh, uh, about a man named Old Blevins. And does anybody know the song I'm talking about? Yes. And basically he just goes blah, 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 blah. And so I hope, I hope that uh, I can transcend that. Um, <laughs> there will be moments when you will definitely look at the person next to you and go. <laughs> Um, so let's see here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about myself, so there are going to be indulgences and there are going to be lots of blatant name dropping, which I, and gossip, which I hope you're here for. And, uh, and there are going to be some boring parts too, I'm sure. So please, and please don't be shy. Ask questions. If there's something that hits you, uh, just raise your hand and I'll call on you if it fits my mood. Okay. So. All right, so anyway, without further ado, I'm going to paraphrase my country comedy uh, character that I created a long time ago, Miss Patsy Decline. She would start her shows by saying, I'm going to plaster a fake smile on my face and try to plow through this shit the best I can. So, all right, so anyway, uh, I always get asked, um, I always get asked by young singers, uh, to, they want to take me out for coffee and ask me, uh, how they can start their career. What should they do? And there's really no answer for it. If you want to be a lawyer, you go to law school. If you want to be a doctor, you go to, to medical school. I was going to say doctor school. Uh, if you want to be a teacher, you know, you know what I'm saying. But if you want to be an artist, there's really no, no path. Uh, you have to just figure it out along the way. At least that's what I had to do. Um, so I'm going to tell you about my weird path and how I got a career, how I managed to uh, have a career as a singer, which is really when you start hearing about this, was such a long shot. Uh, so my weird path was, I grew up in an incredibly abusive family. Uh, my parents were often drunk. Um, they were violent. Our house was filthy. It was filled with dog feces and cat feces. It had fleas. You could see the fleas in the house. Uh, my little sister has scars on her body from flea bites. There was no order, no peace, lots of neglect, and emo my heart's beating now, emotional, emotional and physical abuse. My sister and I pretty much grew up on our own. So, I ran away a lot, and thank God for boys. I always picked nice boys, and I always picked nice boys with nice families, so I could get out of my house and hang out with them, and get some love and attention, and have dinner at a table. That was my favorite thing in the whole world, is I wanted to have dinner at a table. So boyfriends always saved my life. Uh, I didn't graduate from high school because I never went to school. Uh, I missed more classes than I ever went to. And I honestly don't remember one teacher or one class that I had in high school. I don't remember anything about high school, except my greatest accomplishment was I was voted homecoming queen when, in my sophomore year. That meant a lot to me. Uh, the following year, for the next homecoming queen and king, they changed the rules that you actually had to go to school. <laughs> and you had to have passing grades. So, so um, when I came into the world, I just was one of those little girls. I knew what I wanted to be. I loved to dance, and I loved to sing, and I wanted to be an entertainer. I just knew it. And I always felt blessed by that, because I know a lot of people, as they grow older and they get in their 20s, they're trying to figure out what they want to be. I always knew what I wanted to be. I just didn't know how to get there and didn't really have anybody to support me and figure out how to get there. Uh, but my mom told me that the first time I ever commanded an audience, uh, I was about three. She took me to a department store. She was shopping. And she lost me in the store. And when she finally found me, she found me with a crowd gathered around me, I was completely naked and wearing a purple hat on my head and singing Jesus Loves Me. 
my husband still likes me to get naked and wear a purple hat on my face. <laughs> Ed Sullivan Show, which I look at my crowd here, Ed Sullivan Show, I can talk about it and you actually know what I'm talking about, <laughs> was my school. Carol Burnett Show, Lucy, and Ed Sullivan Show was my school. It was so cool because even if you didn't like the acts that were on the Ed Sullivan Show, you watched it. So you'd see Mahalia Jackson, and you'd see The Stones, and you'd see Judy Garland, and kids today kind of go in their one track. And I was exposed to everything, and I absolutely, the people that I loved so much were Sammy Davis Jr., and Cab Calloway, and Pearl Bailey, and Louis Armstrong. I loved those people. And of course, I watched the Mickey Mouse Club and used to dream, how would you get on that show? <laughs> oh, I had a huge cut crush on the little drummer, Cubby O'Brien. Probably some of you gay boys in here had a crush on him too. He was really, really cute. So, Almost every day when, when the house would get quiet late at night, I would go down to the basement and I would sing to all my records. I would uh, sing with my hairbrush in my mirror and I would sing to West Side Story, Officer Krupke, I know that song by heart. Dear Officer Krupke, okay, anyway, that's the, I love to do that song. And uh, Dusty Springfield, I sing to Dusty Springfield, Barbara Streisand, Judy Garland. My big numbers were Garland, Swanee, it was one of my big numbers. And, uh, Don't tell me nothing loud, just I love that song, Strisons. I'm a funny girl. And, uh, and I loved Edie Gourmet's Blues in the Night. Edie was the best because she sang in my key, Strisons and uh, Garland would veer off into outer space and <laughs> leave me behind. But I still tried. So, um, anyway, in choir, in junior high school, I tried out for choir and I did not make it. And I don't remember what happened. Maybe I just didn't fit in or my voice was too low. But of course I took it as a rejection and I was devastated. And I thought, okay, maybe I, maybe I can't sing. And I carried that around for quite a long time. Uh, in high school, things got so bad. And they got so bad that at 16 I left home and I lived with uh, different girlfriends. I crashed on couches. I lived on cots in their basement. I ate cream corn a lot from a can, and I got malnutrition, and my hair fell out, was starting to break off. And the reason I mention that, because my hair was the only thing I was ever confident about. Fortunately, I turned that around, my hair came back, and uh, I moved out of, uh, uh, of um, Elmhurst, Illinois, where I grew up, to a, an apartment outside of Chicago in Oak Park, Illinois, when I was about 18 years old. And I dreamt of being a singer or an actress, I just thought about it all the time, but I didn't know how to do it. I had no training, I had no education, I had no experience, and I really didn't have much support. So I, my first job on my own was a file clerk, which was basically what you needed to know was the alphabet. Um, so I would spend eight hours a day filing things, which was... <laughs> and then I was admissions clerk at a, a, a downtown hospital, which I actually kind of liked because it was the first time I ever got had contact with black people. I grew up in a white suburb, and I just absolutely loved them. And I uh, that was I, I actually kind of liked that job. Uh, and then I was a waitress, and then I was a waitress, and then I was a waitress, <laughs> and. Um, and I was fired from every single job I ever had. Every single job I ever had, I was fired for, for not going to work. That, um, and uh, I was miserable. I had no discipline, so I didn't get up and go to work. I was miserable, I was depressed, and I was lost. Um, there was a glimmer of hope when the production of Hair came to Chicago, and they had open auditions, and I thought, this is it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna audition for this show. And I learned the song, and I sang it over and over again, Paul McCartney's, They are amazed at the way I really love you. And I practiced, and I practiced, and I practiced. And when the auditions finally came to town, I couldn't do it. I was too scared. So, Chicago was gray and cold, and I was depressed, and I wanted to get away from my family ties, but I didn't know what to do. But fortunately, the universe shone down upon me, and I got fired from another job at the restaurant the Thirsty Whale in Melrose Park. <laughs> I got fired and fortunately my boyfriend at the time, Mr. Ken Thompson, who's a doll and I'm still friends with him, he got laid off from his job at the Northwestern train and we decided to get in his rusty white 
a Conline van and head west to hippies with no money and no jobs. And that's exactly what we did. So we jumped in the van and we headed out west and one of the first places we stopped was Denver, Colorado. We had some friends from high school who had settled here and he had some friends at college up in Boulder and I had never seen anything like it. I'd never seen anything so beautiful. The sky was blue, Boulder blew my mind. I didn't know people lived like that in the world. I, I, I just couldn't even believe it. It was, it was just, I, I truly had never seen anything like it. And you're all about the same age that you remember the Dick, Jane, and Sally books? Okay, remember how the boys were always climbing trees and sledding and doing things? And the girls were always on the ground watching the boys <laughs> do things. Well, I remembered that, and I thought, the boys are going skydiving. I'm going to do it. So I did it. I jumped out of a plane. I would never freaking do it again. <laughs> but it was a metaphor. It was a metaphor for me. Because I jumped out of a plane, and it was the bravest thing I had ever done. And I took it as a sign that I could change my life that I was going to move to Denver, where the sun shone, and the sky was blue, and people were happy, and I could jump out of a plane. So anyway, we went out west, we did our trip, and on the way back, I told my boyfriend Ken that I wanted to stay here. And he dropped me off at our friend's house, and I looked for an apartment, and I found a basement apartment on 13th and Clayton, and it had turquoise, a uh, turquoise refrigerator and stove. <laughs> it had a really low ceiling. It was a popcorn ceiling with sparkles. And I lived there. My first meal in Denver, I had no money, I had no friends, I had no job. My first meal was, I ate a box of brown sugar. <laughs> I think I was passed out for a few days after that, but that was my first meal. But then, I got a job. I got a job in Larimer Square. I was a lunch waitress at your father's mustache. Downtown, does anybody remember that? I love you guys. There's not a young person in the crowd. <laughs> so I was a lunch waitress at the, uh, your father's mustache, and your father's mustache had the Dixieland band. Interestingly enough, it was called your father's mustache band. <laughs> And the banjo player was real cute, his name was Dennis, and I told him I wanted to be a singer, and he, he let me audition with the band, and I auditioned with the band, and I sang, Hello, Dolly, well, hello, Dolly, it's so nice, and he didn't hire me. And then, and then I had to get another job, and I got a couple other waitresses' job, and then I found a job, maybe some of you remember this, I got a job, at a place way down on Alameda, way east on Alameda. It was be almost before Aurora was even there. It was one of the last stops east. It was called Loading Dock Restaurant. But I told all the girls that worked at the Loading Dock how much I wanted to be a singer and I didn't know what to do. And one night, they encouraged me to get up and sing. There was a lounge there, a guitar player who played in the lounge. And uh, when he was on break, we were all off work and I had a couple glasses of wine. And I got up and I sang with my eyes shut, a cappella. Oh, my man, I love you so. He'll never know all my life is just a spell. I sang that song. It's the only song I knew all the words to, Robert Streisand, um, funny girl. And uh, there was somebody there that night that had heard me and asked me to come to Windsor Gardens. <laughs> to sing at their luncheon it was my first job. It's my first job. I uh, I sang something like Cat Stevens or. I don't know, I don't even remember what I sung, but I, they paid me $10 and I gave it to the guitar player who was backing me up. And I thought, oh my God, it's so great. These people clapped for me and everything. And I thought, oh my God, this is great. Old people really like me. <laughs> and now they're my peers. <laughs> and, uh, I followed Freddie Hinchy all over town and I would study them. Do, do, were you Freddie Hinchy fans? 
Oh, we had, they were the best. They were the best. A show band, soul band. Uh, the two incredible black guys up front and their soul band behind them. Just hear them. There was another band called the Triple A Band that I used to go hear and follow them around. Jack Wartell was the lead singer and uh, he was fabulous. And Trixie Mer Merkin was the bass player. And uh, I got to know the manager of that band. We got to be friends. And he came over to my apartment on 13th and Clayton one day. And um, he heard me singing to a Roberta Flack record through the door. He got there early and I was singing. And he uh, opened the door and he said, was that you singing? I said, yeah, I was singing. I want to be a singer, but I don't know how. He said, you should come to band practice with the AAA band. You, could, you should come over and sit in with them. I was thrilled. So I went over at the band house and I sat in with the AAA band and I didn't know my keys. But I didn't know any songs really. That was a rock band. I knew lots of Broadway songs and Streisand songs and all that. So they played Honky Tonk Woman and I tried to sing it. And they stopped playing it. The guitar player threw down his guitar, started screaming at me. He said, where have you ever sung before? I said, sing it once you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you have no right to waste our time like this. You have no right to waste our time like this. Uh, and I, I said, I sing to records and stuff. He goes, well, you need to go home and sing to records. I was devastated. It took me, I, I can't even, I don't even remember. I was in the fog. I was like, devastated. I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. And I thought to myself, this is do or die. What am I going to do? I have to be a singer. And I used to go see this charismatic, popular singer in town named Ron Henry. And so I went up to him after I gathered myself, after being devastated by this AAA band guitar moment. And um, I went up to Ron Henry and I lied my ass off. I told him, Hi, I'm a singer. My name is Lanny Garrett, and I'm from Chicago, and I'm a professional singer, and if you ever need a singer, I'd love to have a job. And he said, come over here tomorrow, we're rehearsing. And he wanted a singer, he was putting together this band, and he wanted two black women and a white girl in the middle. And I was a Caucasian. <laughs> and I got the job. I didn't really need to have to sing very well because the two singers I was standing in between, Cheryl Barnes was an incredible trained singer, soul singer, and Carol, uh, Cheryl Barnes and Carolyn Noble, who could sing like Aretha Franklin, she was a church singer. And then Ron Henry was out front. First, uh, uh, we became the house band at a place called the Warehouse Restaurant in Glendale. And it was about 300 seats, and we were the house band opening shows for Grab Your Seats. Ike and Tina Turner, Mel Torme, The Four Tops, Waylon and Madam, um, the B.B. King, uh, The Four, let's see, what did I say, The Four, I said The Four Tops, let's see, I things are on, Donnie Hathaway, Richie Havens, and my idol of all time, Mr. Ray Charles. That was my first real gig. I wasn't very good. The girls sang, uh, Cheryl sang the way we were and brought the house down. Carolyn sang um, uh, Aretha Franklin's, Oh, you don't call anymore. I don't know. Not my she sang that song, brought the house down. I sang at Doobie Brothers, Long Train Running. And my first review in the paper was The new girl, Lanny Garrett, shouts the songs too much and she needs to quit biting her fingernails. <laughs> And the, there was a guy in the audience, he was the manager of the Chambers Brothers, or so he told me. And he told me he had put together this all-girl, eight all-girl band, and that they were going to be the next big hot thing, and would I be interested in joining this band? I said yes, and we went up to Canada, and then the next thing I knew I was in a van with eight girls, driving to the capital of the Yukon, down the Alaskan Highway, to play the summer in the White Horse Yukon, in a town with all guys, hardly any women, and eight girls singing, souls, eight white girls singing funk and soul songs so badly. We had no soul. I will give you a demonstration. 
we played James Brown, if you can imagine, eight 20 year old white girls. Get down! Good God! Get down! Oh, yeah. enough, we packed the place. There were guys standing on their heads, like on shoulders, to come to see us. Uh, and the Chambers Brothers man, I still don't know if he ever was that, or he just told me that, but he would fly in on a private plane and pick up our check, which was probably $5,000 a week, and give us each 60 bucks, and then fly out again. He was very smart. I don't know if it was a con job or what, but, so I spent the summer there, and it's the first time, and the only time in my life I will ever feel like Jennifer Lopez or Pamela Anderson, but that was a good summer. <laughs> So then I joined a couple other bands, but I didn't want to sing Top 40. I wanted my own band, so I came back to Denver, and I thought, how can I find a band? What can I do? Okay, I don't know anybody. Musicians will be at recording studios. I'll get a phone book, and I'll start with Eddie, and I'll call people, in the, I'll call recording studios in the phone book and see if anybody knows any musicians. So I started in the phone book, and the first listing was Applewood Studios, Eddie. And I called Applewood Studios and I said, hi, I'm a singer looking for a band. And the guy that answered the phone said, oh, we're a band, we're rehearsing here, we're looking for a singer, come on down. First call, first call I made. So I went over there and I joined this band, it was called Forecast. Weather Report was really hot at the time, so I think that's where they got the name. They wanted me to sing Flora Purine songs and jazz and stuff, but, and I tried, but I did my best. But um, soon, we started getting noticed. We played a lot of clubs, Green Streets, we played Doc Weeds, Emerson Street East, also my friend Susan Henderson is here. She used to come and see me at those places. And then uh, journalist reporter Jesse Saunders did a, uh, a story about me and uh, put me on the cover of the weekend insert in the newspaper. And things really took off. And pretty soon, the forecast was called Forecast with Lanny Garrett. And then it was called Lanny Garrett and Forecast. And then it was called the Lanny Garrett Band. <laughs> so that's kind of how I started. But things really broke open for me when I had the opportunity to play a gay bar on Broadway called The Broadway. And that place, yes. There you go. I couldn't see exactly where you were. It changed my life. I played in front of gay audiences that were open and spontaneous and demonstrative, and cheered, and clapped, and laughed. A lot of the straighter audience, not quite as open. <laughs> and I started adding comedy to my show. I started really building a show, and the gay community embraced me, and I embraced them that, and for the, fr I'm gonna cry here. for the first time in my life, I remember writing in my diary, kind of like um, Sally Field. They like me, I think they really like me. And I really, really, really owe the gay community so much for my success in my career. So around this time, I was playing a gay bar called Bob's 4444, and Barry Faye was there having dinner, and he came in and saw me, and he called me, and he asked me if uh, he, he wanted to manage my career. So I signed in about 1979 with Barry Faye, and Nothing happened. <laughs> Nothing happened. He never really promoted my career, but I'll tell you what, it was a godsend because I got to go see Whitney Houston, Bruce Springsteen, Bette Midler, Barry Manilow, Joni Mitchell, Prince, Richard Pryor, Randy Newman, Bobby Ray, Billy Joel, and the Stones for free. And more, I couldn't even remember all because Barry Faye was my manager. And Barry Faye set me up in 1981 with, uh, to open a show for a songwriter named Christopher Cross. Uh, he had won Grammys that year. He won more Grammys than any other performer ever had, I think still to this day, for best album, best song, best record, best new artist for his album, Salem. And I got to play at Red Rocks. Oh. I, truly think, I truly think that if you visualize stuff and say it to yourself, it really helps to make it come true. But I couldn't believe when I was standing there that I actually, so many years ago, had said, one day I'm going to play here, and there I was. So in, the, so in the early 80s, I went down to Larimer Square, and I played at a place called Basin's Up for a couple years. We played four nights and sold out. It was before Denver even had a downtown. Larimer Square was kind of it. 
I invited an unknown struggling housewife to open shows for me. She so wanted to be a comic and no one would give her a chance. So Rosa and Barr came and opened my shows many nights when I was down in Armour Square. Um, the urban developer legendary Dana Crawford saw the success at Basin's Up and built me a club across the street. It was called the Cabaret. And I was there for a couple years until some freaking comedians came over there, took it over, and it's still there called the Comedy Works. <laughs> So then I decided I want to take some acting classes, and I took some cold reading classes, not really big acting classes, but it was really fun, I liked it. And a big time casting director came to teach a seminar there, and after seeing me do a scene, he encouraged me to go to LA. So, like a dummy, I believed it, and I went there. <laughs> and uh, they set up some really big time auditions for me in Los Angeles uh, with big casting directors, a guy named Harry Gold, if you know that name, big big casting director, and I even had an audition for a new remake of The Witch that they were thinking about putting on television at Universal Studios. Uh, it was an unbelievably incredible opportunity and door opening for me that most people don't get that chance, but I was completely and totally unprepared. I never really studied acting. I'd never been in a play. I was insecure, and I clutched, and when I tell you I blew these auditions, I still have sphincter <laughs> when I think about it, I still have nightmares. There was a girl in uh, Los Angeles, a cabaret singer and kind of a B-movie actress, uh, Andrea Marcovici, who was doing a show in, um, in uh, West Hollywood at a place called the Gardenia Room. Her show was called Marcovici at Midnight. And I thought, well, that might be something I could do. So I tracked down her manager. And I met with him, and I played him my little promo tapes and everything, and he said, he said, yes. He said, yes, I want to manage you. You just really see some potential here. And he said, uh, I can see that, uh, I can see that uh, putting you on like those nighttime soaps would be really good, like a dynasty, something like that. But you're not pretty enough for that. So, uh, and I said, but I want to be funny. I, I want to be like Carol Burnett or Valerie Hart, you know, Rhoda, you know, I want to do that kind of stuff. That's really where my heart lies. I'd like to be that kind of an actress. He goes, no, 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 no. You are way too homely to be pretty, and you're too pretty to be funny. I swear to God, that's an exact quote. I want to have a pillow needle pointed with his words. Uh, he said he would take me as a client if I would get a boob job, a nose job, and change my hair. I did not have the money, or I probably would have done it. I was an insecure young girl, and I think of all the other young girls out there probably right now thinking the same thing, and if they had the money, they would do it. So anyway, that didn't work out. I did get a movie audition, and I auditioned for a movie called The Destroyer, starring Anthony Perkins. My audition was in Hollywood, and my audition was I had to pretend like I was being electrocuted in an electric chair. <laughs> And I got the part. <laughs> but I got to talk much. I just had to act like I was electrocuted in the electric chair. I got the role of a self-centered, untalented soap opera actress named Sharon Fox. And I want you to know that was quite an acting stretch for me. <laughs> I went out over an act. They told me that I went out over an actress by the name of Yvette Mimieux. Um, I played the part of Anthony Perkins' girlfriend, and it's one of the worst movies you've ever seen in your life. Almost one of those movies that's so bad that it's good. Um, but my favorite line was a line I had to say to Anthony Perkins directly, and this is the exact quote of the line I had to say, was, You can take Oscar and shove it up your ass! <laughs> So that happened, and uh, and then I, I got a, a part in another really horrible movie starring boxer Ken Norton, so you can imagine how good that movie was. I played a prostitute with a heart of gold. <laughs> Did I hear typecasting sounds? <laughs> um, I hated LA. My insecurities were unbearable there. I decided uh, I would be much more comfortable coming back to Denver and being a medium-sized fish in a little pond rather than a completely invisible minnowy-type fish in a huge freaking ocean like LA. So anyway, I think maybe now we'll just take like a 15-minute break. In Denver in the 1980s, uh, if you, many of you remember, there was a big recession. So I decided to come back to Denver right at that time. <laughs> there were no clubs, there were no gigs, there was no money. 
and I couldn't keep a band together. So I hired this amazing musician that I just had the good fortune. He came to, to, to some place where I was and he handed me a tape and I, I got so many cassette tapes from people, but for some reason I listened to this one and it was just a demo tape that he made. His name is Ross Pitts. And he was just so unbelievably talented. He played piano, he did programming, he played guitar, he sang. We put together this little duo and we played Garbos and we played lots of the little gay clubs and piano bars with just the two of us because we could afford that. And uh, he did programming on his, uh, on his synthesizer and we made it through. And then one heartbreaking day, Ross told me that he was moving to Florida with his husband, that one, I guess it wasn't his husband yet, uh, his, uh, his partner, and he was moving away. And I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I asked Ross, since he could produce things and um, create things so amazingly in the studio, and he had a little studio, he made separate cassettes tapes of all sorts of songs that I wanted to sing. And I actually had gotten inspired from knowing all the drag queens in my life who sang to background tapes. And I, so he made me dozens and dozens of background tapes that I put in a suitcase and I filed them in alphabetical order by the name of the song. And I bought a little PA system and I put it in my car and I said, where do I want to play? And I got in the car and I drove to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I started knocking on doors in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and as luck would have it, I went to a place called Vanessi's. They had a piano bar there, and I talked to the owner. Thank God he was a gay man. And, um, and he said, uh, he said, are you a singer? Well, our piano player, uh, Doug Montgomery, who's been there for years and years and years playing every night, something, I think his mother was sick, and he wants to go home for the summer, so it just so happens we're looking for somebody. Come in that night and sing a couple songs with him, and we'll see how you do, and you know, if you're good, we'll hire you. And they hired me, and I sang for three or four months in Santa Fe, several nights a week to my background tapes. I had a person running them, and I'd go, hey, I want to sing, send me a man. And they put the little cassette tape in the player. <laughs> I know, here's a song I want to sing, it's for her. And they put the little cassette tape in there. And that, those cassette tapes, and I still have them, if anyone still has a cassette player, I can actually sing to them. But those tapes got me through the next couple of years. And uh, I played clubs in Vail, I played all over Santa Fe, Geronimo Restaurant and all the, all the clubs down there. And I even played Don't Tell Mamas in New York. And I played, uh, uh, played the Rose Tattoo in West Hollywood. And while doing a show with those tapes in San Diego, after my show, I, a young uh, a gay man by the name of Mark Olmsted came running backstage and said, oh my god, you're so funny, I'm a comedy writer and I'd love to write comedy for you. And, and so we got to be friends. And we went out uh, maybe the next day, and we met in La Jolla, and we met for drinks in the afternoon, and we got shit-faced on white wine. And as you often do when you're with uh, a gay friend, you get shit-faced and try and come up with good drag names. <laughs> and so we came up with drag names, I, you know, Anita Apartment and all sorts of things. <laughs> And he came up with this name, I thought it was hilarious, Patsy D. Klein. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now it's about 1989, and a show came to town, Annie Main uh, came to the Denver Center, and uh, there was a cast party after. I went with my friend Tommy Weiss, and we went to the cast party, and we met the drummer from the show, from the band, and uh, his name was Cubby O'Brien. <laughs> So Cubby O'Brien, who was a Mouseketeer when he was a little boy, but now he wasn't a little boy anymore. Uh, I met him at the party and we decided to go have a drink. And we went to this place on 17th that Clift Young owned. It was this new little place and it had leopard skin and zebra skin and jewels on the walls and these big chandeliers. And I just thought it was the most wonderful place in the whole world. And I, I said to Cliff, no, I said, what are you doing with this place? He goes, oh God, we just can't make it work. We spent all this money, we can't make it work. And uh, he said, you wanna take it over? I called my friend Tommy Wax, and uh, we took over that nightclub, and on 17th, it was called Ruby Nightclub. Yeah! yeah. yeah. It only held about 120 people, but it was just outrageously decorated, and I told my friend Tommy, I said, you know, this place looks like Earth and Kitchen. It's all velvet and lush and cat and stuff like that. 
So I figured out how to track her down. I tracked down Earth the Kit, and one of the first people that I booked at Ruby Nightclub was Earth the Kit. We paid her $2,500. Unbelievable. And she did her shows at Ruby. I was so excited. Eartha Kitt, she was one of my idols. She was a legend, and she was playing at a little 120. I think the tickets were, and we thought it was outrageous for $20 or something like that. Uh, and of course, she packed the place. She did a couple shows a night. And uh, I remember I was so nervous to meet her, and she was getting ready in the dressing room, and I went backstage, and I, uh, Miss Kitt, can I get you anything? And you know, if you need wine or anything, can I get you a coffee? What do you need? What do you need? And she just looked at me, and she said, Coffee. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Eartha, Eartha Kitt played our club. I sang there, but I did the booking too, and I brought in people. I brought in the, uh, Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks. I brought, brought in Mose Allison, one of the greatest jazz artists of all time. The wonderful singer Kenny Rankin played at Ruby. Uh, the Del Rubio triplets from Pee Wee's Playhouse played Ruby, <laughs> if you remember them. And Tiny Tim. Played Ruby, um, Tiny Tim, what an amazing. Um, and at Stock Show, uh, at Stock Show, I needed to come up with some idea, uh, some country act to book at the club. I, I had been doing big band and the Lanny Garrett band at the show, but Stock Show was coming to town. Who could I possibly book? And I went. So I ran out, and uh, Michael O'Banion on Broadway, had, what was the name of his place? Ricochet. Ricochet. I ran down to Ricochet, and I bought some cowgirl of duds, and I got a wig, and I showed up with the Randy Handley band. I hired them to back me up. I had not written anything. We just threw a bunch of country tunes, Ring of Fire, and you know all sorts of Hank Williams, and all sorts of songs together. And the next thing I knew, people were lining up out the door. It was the most successful thing I'd ever done. Each night I did the show, I would add another joke, and I'd remember it when anybody laughed, and I put that in the show, and all of a sudden, Patsy Decline was really born. During the same time, uh, in the 90s, I was asked to sing with the Colorado Symphony, my own show with the Colorado Symphony, and I showed up to rehearse with them, and I could see uh, by their faces, uh, they were, uh, I, well, I don't read music, and I didn't know anything about music, and I was nervous, and I could... I could feel the people in the symphony who were trained and went to school and their whole life, and music and knowledge and stuff, they were kind of... <laughs> I actually had a, a chart for a song called Sleazy Love. Does anyone remember that song? I was actually going to play the song Sleazy Love of the Symphony. Gee, I wonder why they were rolling their eyes in the <laughs> But thank God there was the most amazing man in the symphony. In fact, I think he was one of, the, was, is it true that he was one of the first black musicians in a symphony? Charlie Burrell, he's, yeah. he was, he was there. And he, I was so nervous and he knew, he knew that they were kind of treating me shitty and he came up afterwards and he said, he said, look, he said, you just own this girl. He said, the reason we're here is because you're here. This is your show, so you just own it and you go out there and you sing those songs and we'll back you up. That's Charlie Burrell. Uh, this couple, uh, the McFarlands, owned the Denver Buffalo Company. They had just opened up the Denver Buffalo Company and they used to come see my shows at Ruby. And when Ruby was closing, they were at one of my last shows and they said, God, God, we just, we just wish we had a showroom uh, where you could play. And I said, I'll be there tomorrow afternoon. And I went over there and I said, you know, you could just put it right over here. We could have curtains, we could do the stage, we could... And they built me a showroom. It was called the Recliner Lounge. And I played at the Denver Buffalo Company for 10 years. Yeah. Um, well, the owner got sick, and uh, very sick, and they had to sell it. And there I was after 10 years without a stage again. So I had to figure that out. So I knocked on doors again, and uh, I saw a band called the Gypsy Swing Review, and I asked them if I could sing with them, and they said yes, and I put a show together with the Gypsy Swing Review called Under Pair of Skies, and I went to the Cherry Creek Inn. I remember Dana was there on, on one of my opening nights there, and a wonderful, wonderful artist by the name of Lonnie Hanson created this, this, uh, this Under Pair of Skies outfit for me with the Eiffel Tower on my head. 
and uh, I played the summer at the Cherry Creek Inn up on the roof doing gypsy jazz. I also knocked on the door of the Marriott in Westminster, and I talked them into letting me use the ballroom on weekends to do the Patsy Decline show, and uh, kind of muddled through with those things. Then I heard the Rattlebrain Theater uh, under the clock tower was going out of business, and Lonnie, who always, Lonnie Hanson, who always wanted to design a club, and I went down and looked at it, and I don't know why I signed the lease. And I, signed, I do not, I just wanted a club so bad, I put my house, the only thing I ever owned, on the line. We got a loan, we jumped in and opened Lanny's Clock Tower Cabaret. I cried. <laughs> On and slowly, 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 people started coming to the show. I got really smart and I started booking, uh, booking acts. Freddie Henschey played their Chris Daniels. I got really smart and they demented divas, nuclear waste. David Westman said the audience. They brought the house down. People started showing up. We started doing late night mag magic shows and burlesque shows and renting it out for private parties. I started developing more uh, of my shows. I did a, song, a tribute to the movies, which you can see my friend Kevin Copenhaver from the Denver Center made a lot of my hats and costumes. Um, that's a, a hat I wore that has uh, Academy Awards, if you can't see it, Oscars all over it. And, and uh, uh, he, he, let's see, I did Any Swing Goes Big Band with a 10-piece big band. I did a tribute to the Beatles and to Backrack, Great Women of Song, Betty Goodman, a Frank Sinatra tribute called the uh, Chick Sings Frank. Uh, let's see what else is up there. Valentine shows, Christmas shows. Uh, so things started picking up. I booked National Acts. Uh, I booked Chris Calloway, who was the daughter of Cab Calloway, and she brought the house down. She was a wonderful singer. Uh, I booked Leon Redbone. I booked the Mills Brothers, Maria Maldara, Melissa Manchester. Joe Piscopo from SNL did a fantastic, unbelievable show. Uh, Julia Sweeney from SNL played with our hometown girl, uh, Jill Sovio. Uh, they did a show together, uh, Jill and Julia. And um, one of my, fav my favorite, I, I could watch Woody Allen movies 24 hours a day. I, my favorite one is Broadway Danny Rose. Did you see that movie? Yeah. If you remember it at all, there was, uh, it's a, he plays the manager of an Italian singer. Uh, in it, and I just loved that movie so much, and I tracked down the Italian singer in that movie, his name is Nick Apollo Forte, and I hired him to play the club. <laughs> he wasn't a big draw. <laughs> I wrote shows for other people, other, I saw a wonderful actor by the name of Leonard Barrett, and I wrote him a show about Nat King Cole. I wrote shows, uh, Marvin Gaye, a Motown review, a Carpenter's review for another singer. And in, 19, uh, in 2015, I got a phone call uh, from some people that said I was being inducted into the Colorado Music Hall of Fame. Um, I broke down in tears. My husband was, was there when I got the call and I kind of fell apart. It was, I just, it was just like... It was pretty special to me. I was inducted um, in April of 2016 along with Glenn Miller and many other deceased notables. <laughs> I was the only person alive. <laughs> uh, that same year, in 2016, I sold my share of Lanny's Clock Tower Cabaret. I took my name off the club. And when I shared with some friends that I would never, ever go back there again, they were actor friends that worked out at the Littleton Town Hall. They told them out there, and Littleton Town Hall called me and said, if you need a stage, our door is open. And for the next couple of years, in 2017, I did um, a, a couple shows there, a Frank Sinatra tribute, and uh, I can't remember what other one I did. In 2018, I did uh, a swing sets tribute to Benny Basie. Uh, in Count Basie, and uh, I did a show, and then I did, the last show I did was Patsy Decline in October of 2018, and I want to just acknowledge the all-time greatest, most faithful Patsy Decline fan in all the world, my friend Joe Contardo here. This is the first time I have ever seen him in normal clothes. He would always come to the Patsy show in full cowboy drag. <laughs> I've never seen him dressed as a normal human being. So.
so it's lovely and peaceful. Um, so Patsy Decline was my last show, and it was really, it was really moving because so many fans turned out, so many friends turned out, people flew in. My friend Ross Pitts, who made me the cassette tapes, was living in Mexico, and he flew in, and uh, it was just such a special time. But it was the Patsy Decline band. Now, I don't know if you've seen my shows a lot, you know that I had met in 1979, I hired a saxophone player by the name of Bob Rebholz. Does anybody sort of remember seeing him? Uh, he's been with me from, from 1979 to, the, to 2018, and the week before he played the Great Women of Song tribute show at Littleton. But this was the Patsy Decline show, and he wasn't in that band. And it was kind of hard for me, because it was going to be my last show, and Bob, who'd been by my side longer than any other musician, wasn't going to be there. So I came back, I come back at the end of the show, not, I, I take my wig off and I come back as Lanny, and I sing, um, um, I, I'm so lonesome I could cry. Let's hear the lonesome whippoorwill, the sounds to beautify. From the back, I hear a saxophone play. Mm -hmm. Dressed like a cowboy, Bob Rebholz comes just wailing, comes walking out, and I lost it! <laughs> And so that was my last song and my last show, and Bobby came out and do it. Now, I really can't believe uh, the blessings. I cannot believe that I was even asked to be here at the very classy History Museum to be here. I can't believe the blessings and adventures this career has given me. So here comes the name dropping part. I've hung out with the four tops and had cocktails with them. I smoked a joint and listened to jazz records in my own apartment with Ramsey Lewis. Uh, Barry Fay invited me to join him for dinner at a local Chinese restaurant on, on Broadway called Shangri-La with the Rolling Stones. I sat across from Ron Wood and his gorgeous model wife and they were really sweet and down to earth. And Mick Jagger's girlfriend was there, her name was Jerry F Hall, and she had the biggest freaking feet I've ever seen in my entire life. I did a fundraiser with Muhammad Ali, and after the fundraiser, I actually got to hang out with him in his hotel suite with his kids, and I remember him ranting about religious stuff. I can't remember everything he said, but I remember him holding court. Uh, I went shopping in Beverly Hills with Roseanne Barr to find an outfit for her first appearance on the Johnny Carson show, and we decided to make her look like a housewife from Bear Valley, which she was, and that she was appearing on the Carson show for the first time. So we didn't dress her up, we made her kind of frumpy and we put a big corsage on her, on her outfit. And I got to watch her from backstage as she killed it on the Carson show and I waved goodbye to her as she walked into superstardom. Um, let's see, uh, in, the night, in the late 1980s I was fixed up in New York on a blind date with a tall skinny guy with a big Jufro. He was a struggling comedy writer. And uh, we went out to dinner, and then we went to a cabaret where I sat in. And he said, oh, he said, you, you have a cabaret act? I said, yes. He said, I I'd be happy to write you comedy for a cabaret act. Uh, if you thousand dollars, and I, I thought about it. Um, I didn't have a thousand dollars, so I never went through with it. His name was Larry David. <laughs> he is the highest paid comedy writer ever in history. <laughs> that night he took me to Caroline's uh, Comedy Club where he, uh, after the, the stand-up comedy, so he, they had uh, uh, some acts that he had written, little vignettes that he had written for the actors there, and uh, as it turned out they were like the beginning uh, seeds of the Seinfeld show. Uh, I, I recognized when the Seinfeld show was up, that, that was a vignette, that was a vignette, that was a vignette. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, and my husband won't like this, but you know, I told you I met Cubby O'Brien. Um, I not, not only met him, I made out with him that night, too. <laughs> Visualize, people. Visualize. <laughs> uh, I took Tiny Tim, uh, after he played the club, I took him out to dinner. We went to Berardi's on 17th Avenue. He brought his own silverware because he was a germaphobe. He was so sweet. He was just, he's as eccentric and crazy as you can ever imagine, but he was so sweet. And then when I was driving him back to the hotel, he asked me if we could stop at the ride-in. 
Rite Aid and very unabashedly said he needed to pick up some Depends. <laughs> so um, then uh, Grace Kelly's son, Prince Albert, heard my first CD, Comes Love, and hired me to sing at the Monaco Yacht Festival. What, billionaires. I mean, it was amazing. But the most exciting thing when I was there was that I saw Ringo Starr uh, crossing the street with his beautiful wife, Barbara Bach, who was a Bond girl, and their uh, arms were just filled with shopping bags in Monaco. That was the highlight of that. I had the great honor of performing the Vagina Monologues at the Denver Center with veteran Broadway actress Glynis Bells and a gorgeous singer-actress named Rhonda Ross, who later I found out was the love child of Diana Ross and Barry Gordy. Rhonda and I became very good friends, and when I opened Lanny's Clock Tower Cabaret, she graciously graced our stage and brought the house down. One of my all-time career highlights, and this might be it, was I was asked to open a show at Fiddler's Green uh, for Ray Charles. And uh, I played with my, my big band there, and my big band and I got a standing ovation that night in front of opening for Ray Charles. It blew my mind. And I was so thrilled and so excited, and Ray Charles was coming out, and there was this big, what's, what's it called, Bussendorfer? Or that, that, anyways, very expensive, very giant piano. And I knew Ray Charles was coming out after we left the stage. And so before I left the stage, I said, excuse me, I have to do one thing. And I picked my butt, and I rubbed it all over Ray Charles' piano. <laughs> it was Ray Charles' piano. <laughs> so. That was that was one of the best the best shows I was ever ever. Ray Charles. <laughs> so I'm gonna fast forward. As you can see, I, I look like a pretty happy person. I have a happy life. I've got great friends. Many of them are sitting here tonight. I have no violence, no abuse. I always picked really nice men, and uh, in my life, I didn't do the the circle picking the bad ones. Shockingly, I didn't become a drug addict or an alcoholic. Hey, well, Maybe a little alcoholic, but it's <laughs> under control. Uh, eight years ago, I married the man of my dreams. It was the first marriage for me. The first marriage in the second half. Well, actually, the last third of my life. And uh, get this, my, my wonderful idols, the people that I used to go see before I was a singer, the Freddie Henshaw Band played my wedding. Uh, it was the last gig they ever played. Um, I don't take anything for granted. And as I look back at this stage of my life, I can't believe this all happened. And I truly thank all of you who came out to see me and clapped and cheered and smiled at me when I was looking out in the audience. I, I just can't thank you enough. It's the only thing I ever wanted to do. I made my living for over four decades as a singer and performer. I own two nightclubs. One even had my name on it. I'm a part of this incredible Denver community. And here I am standing and talking to you at the Colorado History Museum. Who would have ever thought it? I'm thankful and grateful. Now here's my theory for being on stage. I was never the greatest singer, but what I always loved to do is I loved performing, I loved being in front of people, and I loved the energy that would go back and forth. My friend, my friend David Winkler <coughs> understands, because he's that kind of performer who gets his buzz off the audience. Um, here's my theory, and I'm gonna send this out to my girlfriend, Janine. Just let your light shine, because when we do that, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. When we become liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates them. And that's what I loved about being on stage. When Patsy the Klein would perform and I would go out into the audience and I'd pick somebody that I knew was terrified. They'd be looking down and I'd go, you, come up on stage with them. They, no, no, I don't want to, I don't want to. And then finally, you could see the shift. And they'd say, I'm going to skydive. <laughs> and they'd get on stage and they'd do everything I told them to do. And they'd open up and their light would shine. And that was my favorite thing. How many times did I? I picked you a few times, didn't I? <laughs> that was my favorite thing about performing, was seeing those, seeing people that were maybe afraid to express themselves. Oh, you gay guys, you had it under control. I didn't have to worry about you. Uh, people who were shy about expressing themselves open up. That was my very favorite thing was seeing people let their guard down. And for any of you who are dreaming about doing something, here's all I can say. Don't wait until everything is just right. It will never be perfect. There will always be challenges and obstacles and less than perfect conditions. So what? Get started. 
With each step you take, you'll grow stronger and stronger, more skilled and more self-confident and more and more successful, I promise. Oh, okay, we're gonna end it, but on the last note, remember that mean guitar player? The one that threw his guitar band and said, don't you ever waste people's time? I ran into him a few years ago. He was selling bagels at a bakery in Boulder. Thank you very much. Well, just pretend I'm in this outfit with that wig on my head, and this is a song that Patsy Decline would sing, and this is a song off. Can somebody shout, will you, honey? Will you shout. This is a song off my 43rd. 43rd best song record album. This is off my album entitled "A Water Bag's No Place for a Pinhead Like You." <laughs> Anyway, what I'm trying to say is, baby, you're the greatest. At any rate, at least you're pretty good. Strong. 